Good morning and welcome New Heights family. Thank you for choosing to join us again this week. If this is your first time with us, we want you to know that we are grateful to have the opportunity to connect with you and your family. We love to pray for you and our body of believers, so please send us an email at prayer at newheightschurch.com. We'd be honored to hear from you. Also, we would love, love, love to hear the stories of what community has looked like for you during this pandemic season. If you have a picture, a story, or even a video of your community group or a neighborhood gathering or other creative ways you've gathered together, please send me an email at dawn at newheightschurch.com. Children's Ministry, we're hosting our Backyard Bible Club in the field behind the Boys and Girls Club this coming Wednesday, July 28th at 9 a.m. and Wednesday, August 5th. Last, I want to share that a few weeks ago we gathered outside in the field behind the Boys and Girls Club. It was so wonderful. We were spread out in small groups, worshiped, prayed, and communed together with God. And we're going to do it again. August 2nd and 23rd at 9 a.m. outside in the field behind the Boys and Girls Club. Please bring your own blanket or chair and a face mask, and we invite you to join us. Twelve years ago this September, after a whole series of coincidences and supernatural confirmation, New Heights received an anonymous gift of $1.2 million to purchase 40 acres of land on Weddington. I'm standing on that land right now. Later, we paid a small sum of money and bought five more acres contiguous to the 40, so that we now own about 45. We used the land as collateral to borrow money to build onto the Boys and Girls Club. We also allowed another nonprofit, Cobblestone, to farm 10 acres of the land. About a year ago, New Heights began collaborating with Potter's House, the Endeavor Foundation and Strategic Realty to explore the possibility of building affordable rental housing on a portion of the land, as well as building a processing center for Potter's House and upgrading cobblestone farms. In order to do that, the land had to be de-annexed by the county, annexed by the city, and rezoned by the city in absolutely record time to apply for the 10 to 11 million dollars in federal funds we needed to build the homes. In February of this year, the land was annexed by the city and rezoned, and an application was made for the possible funding of the project. The funding process is very complex and very competitive. Last week, it was announced that we have been awarded $10.5 million in tax credits and a $450,000 grant to do this project. That's really good news, and I know all of us need some really good news right now. In addition, New Heights is working with Cobblestone Farms to completely restructure the farm under the supervision of Kelton Hayes, a New Heights member. This is Kelton, and I want him to say a few words about the project. So my wife Aubrey and I, we've been members of New Heights for about five years and during that time we've also been involved with her family farm, uh, our family farm, uh, and we felt like God was leading us to be more involved in full-time agriculture. So I met with Jim about two months ago and shared with him what God has been doing in our life and what he's equipped us over the last five years. And uh, it was funny, at the beginning of our meeting he said, God, I don't know what we're going to talk about, but you do. Uh, and then after I unveiled my thoughts and plans to him and wanting to hear his wise counsel, he told me about this opportunity to be a part of the church, what the church is doing on this property. So I'm going to step into full-time farm manager, executive director role with Cobblestone Farms. And we're going to continue on the good work that they've been doing over the last decade. We're going to change some things up, but our mission going forward is we're going to cultivate the land, we're going to feed the hungry, and we're going to pass it on. And I cannot think of a better way to utilize the background and the skill set that God has given me and my family than to do that right alongside our church and to bless the community of Northwest Arkansas at large. Hi, my name is Sean Schwartzman, and I work with Potter's House, and we are extremely excited about partnering with New Heights Church and Endeavor and Cobblestone about what is going to happen on this land. Uh, our part is we're excited to help families understand about the opportunities out here. Uh, we're planning on building a donation center for our thrift stores that's going to provide 
jobs for people, but also people who live right here on the land, that they can work here and live here and uh, take produce from the garden. I mean, it'll just be all encompassing. And uh, overall, it's just exciting for us to see more affordable housing come for our families here in Fayetteville, jobs, the, the whole process has been uh, an absolute God thing and we're excited to be a part of it. All of this is a huge answer to prayer and a confirmation that God is blessing our efforts to love people tangibly in a very significant way. Please join with us in celebrating this incredible blessing and in prayer that somewhere along the way in the next two years that we are able to build a multi-use chapel on the land as well. Thank you for your support of New Heights Church and this project. We thought you could use some good news right now. I know I'm still celebrating this and will be for a while to come. God bless you all. Would you join me now as we pray together our giving prayer? Lord Jesus, you gave your very life for us. We want to be generous like you. Form us into a generous people. Free us from fear, worry, and selfishness. We trust you with our provision and we give with joyful hearts, knowing that where our treasure is, there our hearts will be also. Amen. You unravel me with melody You surround me with a song Of deliverance from my enemies Till all my fears are gone I'll no longer, let's sing it I'll no longer say Cause I am a child of God I'm no longer saved to fear Cause I am a child of God mother's womb you have chosen me love has called my name I've been born and I've been born again to your family your blood flows through my veins and I'm no longer I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear Cause I am a child of God A 
with me What can separate us? You are for me What can stand against us? Your love, it won't let go I know it won't In darkness, shadows Have no power over me Fear is empty And shame has no We love you, and we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the, for the opportunity to, to come before you and worship. And Lord, we thank you for your promises, and we thank you for the things that you speak to us. We thank you that we hear from you in your word. Lord, speak to us today. Let us be mindful of you as we, as we learn more about you today. We love you so much. And it's in your name I pray. Amen. This is the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of Man.
Good morning and welcome back to our series in the Gospel of Mark. Do me a favor, open your Bibles or Bible devices to Mark chapter 8. Last Sunday, Kevin gave us a great talk as he walked us through Mark chapter 8, verses 11 through 30. And, and we left Jesus and the disciples in a place called Caesarea Philippi. Now, Caesarea Philippi is located about 26 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. What today is in the far north of Israel, tucked into a corner of land that's bordered by Lebanon and Syria. And if you were to go there today, it would look like this. I have been there, and it looks exactly like that. Springs, streams, very, very beautiful. Now, this is a picture looking at the cave where one of the springs was located. The springs were centers of of pagan worship, and this cave is called the, the Gates of Hades. The Canaanites had worshipped Baal there. The Greeks had worshipped Pan, the god of fertility and and nature. And the Romans were there. Well, they were worshipping Caesar. Caesarea Philippi tied together the religious and political systems that that had plagued God's people since they they were God's people in the Promised Land. And, And this is a fitting backdrop of peoples and beliefs that Jesus has been leading his disciples through since day one of his ministry. It's here that Jesus asks his disciples two very important questions. Now, Kevin, he talked about these questions last week. Jesus asks, who do the people, who do the people say that I am? And then he asks this question, who do you say that I am? Now, the answer to question number one was about the crowds of people that were following Jesus, who were enthralled with Jesus because of the miracles. They were, they were looking for someone who would usher in a, a new age in the life of Israel. Someone who would, who would open the door for the coming Messiah, or, or perhaps even be the Messiah himself, who would kick the Romans back to Rome and usher in a a time of unprecedented economic prosperity and prestige. An unprecedented golden age in the life of God's people. Now, question number two was this. Who do you say that I am? And Peter, he knocks knocks the answer out of the park. Peter says, well, you are the Messiah. Matthew's account gives us a fuller record of Peter's answer. He says this, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Meaning that Peter, in contrast to what everyone else may think of Jesus, Peter is not only declaring that Jesus is the one promised by God to be the one uniquely appointed by God to be the Christ, the Messiah, but Peter is declaring that Jesus is God himself. So whatever is true of God is true of Jesus. Whatever God is and all that God is, Jesus is. Now, let's let's be clear. This is what Jesus has been announcing since day one of his ministry. This is what is at the core of what Jesus is all about. What's recorded for us in Mark chapter 1, verse 15. Really, really important. Jesus' message is that the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. This is the purpose statement of Mark. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And all of that incomprehensible divinity is at hand. God, who is unknowable, now takes on the flesh and blood of our created humanity. And he dwells with us. The time for anticipating all that is fulfilled. Jesus is here. Which is Peter's mic drop answer, right? You are the Messiah. Now, what we're coming to today is what happens after Peter's answer. Same place, same backdrop. Caesarea Philippi, and Jesus introducing what will be the second half of the book of Mark. Now, Jesus will be teaching his disciples and us what what it means that he is the Christ, what it actually means to follow him, what it means to repent and believe in the gospel. There are two parts to what Jesus will be teaching us this morning. First, he'll be teaching us that we need to have an understanding of who he is. Secondly, He'll be teaching us that that we need to choose how we will respond to that truth. Now, I want us to be careful here. It's not that we'll know everything there is to know about Jesus, but as God reveals himself to us, as God comes to us and by grace reveals enough of who he is, we need to respond to that truth in that time. 
So now we come to our text for this morning and we get to see what Jesus said and what Peter missed. Mark chapter 8, verse 31. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside, and he began to rebuke him. Now, the title Son of Man, as it's used in Scripture, focuses on Jesus being born in the flesh and blood of our humanity. In other words, Jesus being fully man. The title Son of Man also means the the one who, in the end times, will bring God's kingdom to earth. It's a title that covers a lot of territory in the hopes of God's people. Now, in verse 32, Jesus uses the word plainly, meaning there there was no way to misunderstand what he was saying. Jesus immediately began to teach the disciples a truth that they had to wrap their minds around. He wanted them to, to understand why he had come. He hadn't come for a coronation, but for a cross. This wasn't the time for a political movement, but a spiritual one. This time he came as the suffering Savior, a payment for our sins. Why? Because the Bible tells us that without the shedding of blood, Jesus' blood, there would be no forgiveness of sins. This was something even the Jewish theologians missed. The Old Testament is filled with talk about a suffering servant. But the theologians of the day never connected this with the Messiah. And Peter, no theologian. Certainly couldn't understand this. So he does, he does what Peter often does, right? He sticks his foot in his mouth. And Peter took him, Jesus, aside and he began to rebuke him. Rebuke the Messiah, huh? Literally, the idea is that Peter tries to shut Jesus up. He took him aside and he said, hey, Jesus, are you nuts? What is this suffering business? This, this being killed thing, this talk about coming back from death. The Messiah is a symbol of strength, not weakness. Jesus, please be quiet about all that. Earlier, Peter had gotten the right answer. He knocked it out of the park. He he had gotten the who. He just hadn't yet gotten the what. Verse 33, but when Jesus turned and and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. "Get, Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Now, is is Peter Satan? No. The word here literally means adversary. But Peter's rebuke mirrors the same opposition, the same tactics that Satan uses to influence the crowds. In other words, would Satan have loved for Jesus to be a popular Messiah? You bet. Maybe even Jesus getting set up as king of Israel and and living out his days leading God's people as the ruler. Would Satan be okay with that? Sure. But at all costs, Satan didn't want Jesus to atone for our sins. Ruler, ruler, great. A sacrifice for the sins of the world? Not so much. Remember the the temptations in Matthew chapter 4? Satan promised Jesus that he he could be the ruler of Israel and even more. All the kingdoms of the world are mine, Satan says, and I'll give them to you. Just do things my way. Jesus, just worship me. So Jesus says to Peter, Peter, what you're focused on, what you've set your heart and mind on, what you're hanging on to is Satan's agenda, not God's. You're like the crowd who follows me for my miracles, but not for my message. And in this moment, it's tempting to judge Peter. We would never do that. I would never do that. But seriously, what about us? Who is Jesus to us? And I know, I know that we know the right answer. We get who Jesus is. We know that God has chosen to love us and to call us into relationship with him. We understand what God has done for us and what he gives us now and forever. And we should bask in that, marinate in that, because there is a blessing in knowing the reality of who Jesus is. But also, there's a danger we face that even in knowing who Jesus is, we might still be trying to follow Jesus on our terms and not his. So in verse 34, Jesus clarifies what it really means to follow 
him on his terms. Verse 34, then he, Jesus, called the crowd to him along with his disciples, meaning that this, this teaching isn't just for the 12, but, but for all of us. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples, and he said this, whoever wants to be my, my disciple must deny themselves and take up the cross and follow me. Now, two ways from the text on how to follow Jesus. First, to follow Jesus means that we must deny ourselves. Think about Peter in the courtyard. The night Jesus was betrayed, flash forward to that moment. Jesus, I never knew the man. That's denial. To, to deny translates a Greek word that means to have no connection with someone or something. To deny ourselves is to reject any association with our former selves. In other words, who we were apart from Jesus. Who we were apart from Jesus as followers of Jesus. Whatever we were addicted to, whatever controlled us, whatever we were devoted to or focused on or captivated by, whatever associations, whatever attitudes, whatever was not of God, we no longer have any association with. We don't go back to dwell on what once was. We don't go back and rehearse old relationships and habits and hang-ups. Now, let me illustrate. In Luke chapter 9, Luke records for us the time when Je- a time when Jesus was heading to Jerusalem. And he was confronted by, by three men. And the first man tells Jesus, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. So Jesus tells him that to follow him might mean that he, he never has a home. Say what? Can you imagine that today when so many are focused on one dream home after another? Homes that are big enough to hold all of our toys, all the little things and comforts we surround ourselves with, the choices we make in how we invest our time, talent, and treasure. I'll follow you anywhere. Well, um, you're going to be homeless. Now, let's be honest. At that point, many of us would, would qualify our following. Uh, Well, on second thought, I'll follow you as long as it doesn't too severely impact my lifestyle. Now, the next two men put conditions on following Jesus. Isn't that interesting? The first guy says, well, um, I need to go bury my father. And and the next guy says, well, uh, first, I need to say goodbye to my family. Let's be honest. Many of us qualify our following. Jesus, I'll follow you, but, but, but really, my family comes first, or my job comes first, or my hobbies come first. Or something else, you name it. Something else qualifies our following. Not that we'd actually say it, but actions speak louder than words. Our actions always demonstrate what we really believe. So Jesus says at the end of that passage, he says in Luke chapter 9 and verse 62, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Simply put, To deny ourselves is to stop looking back, to stop looking around, and to choose to look forward to Jesus. Jesus is up ahead. He's the fixed point. We're following Him. Life is about Him, going where where He is going, where He leads. Whatever that may mean, He has control, His will, His direction. Any other concern, any other priority for our lives is secondary. Life is about Jesus, not us. Everything is run through the Jesus grid not ours. So, what does it mean to follow Jesus? First, it means that we must deny ourselves. Secondly, to follow Jesus means that we must take up our cross. Now, the cross for Jesus stood for shame, humiliation, degradation. He was hung on a criminal's cross. On the cross, Jesus was demeaned and he was debased. By the way, the cross we carry isn't just inconvenience or something we have to quote-unquote endure because we're Christians. You know, you've heard this before. We tithed instead of buying that new 70-inch flat-screen TV. We're suffering for Jesus. Hmm, really? I want us to see this. Really important. The cross is symbolic of what reduces us to humility, what offends our pride, what shames us, what breaks us, what robs us of everything. What forces us to let go of ourselves until we, until, we are real, until, until we really are all in, totally surrendered to God. Paul describes taking up our cross in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. He writes these words, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, 
I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So I have to ask myself, am I hearing Paul? To take up my cross is the day-to-day living of the Christian, of the Christian life by letting everything die that is not of God. In other words, what idols have I, have I put in my life that replaces supremacy and wonder of God? Am I worshiping comfort or safety or family or stuff or sports? In another time and place when Jesus was teaching about what it means to take up our cross and follow me, Jesus said in Luke chapter 14 and verse 20, he said these words, suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Now, it would be easy to hear that and and think about what? Building projects and budgets and financial considerations. We think, well, you know, a wise builder should calculate the financial cost of, of his or her project before they begin to build to make sure he or she has the resources necessary to complete the project. But the point here is not about the cost of the project. The point here is about the cost of the commitment required to carry out, to carry our cross. Jesus's point can be expressed in a question. Are you committed to finishing what you started? That is to see the commitment you make through to the very end. So, To take up the cross means to take up the instrument of our own execution. That's mind-boggling. The person carrying the cross is already condemned. We're dead, dead men walking, dead women walking. In those days, criminals who were condemned to death before they were crucified, they were made to carry their crosses to the place of execution. Jesus says that following him means that we follow without limits, even to the point of being condemned and killed for him. To take up our cross is a commitment of our whole lives to God. It's the journey of our whole lives, point A to point B, even knowing that death may be required. So Jesus is asking, are we that committed? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I've been reading a lot of him lately, so you're going to hear me quote him. In his book, The Cost of Discipleship, he writes about cheap grace and costly grace. And he says, cheap grace is the grace we bestow on ourselves. The preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance. Baptism without church discipline. Communion without confession. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ. Living and incarnate. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again. The gift which must must be asked for. The door at which a, a man must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. And it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life. And it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. Jesus says, think about what you're getting yourself into. Do you really want to follow me? To follow Jesus will cost us everything. Now we come to verses 35 through 38. And Jesus is going to focus on three things that all of us fear. Three areas where we might struggle with being, quote unquote, all in. Fear number one is the loss of life. Verse 35, Jesus says, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Ultimately, the desire to save our own life is our desire to to preserve our version of what we think our life should be like. Our goals, our dreams, our plans. We think that if we can hang on to how how we think our life should be lived, that we're we're actually preserving our lives. That somehow there's going to be fulfillment in all of that. But but deep down, we we know that we ourselves can't achieve the fulfillment of our desires. Why? Well, because life, people, and circumstances always get in the way. So in trying to live freely the way we want, all we do is end up with fear. The fear of loss the fear of failure, and the fear of inadequacy. And, and yet, and yet, somehow we're afraid to let go of all that. Crazy, right? We're actually addicted to the meaninglessness of our lives. We're afraid that God's plan for our lives just might not fit our agenda for how we think our life should go. We're thinking, 
what will God really require of us? But the more we cling to our cherished version of life, the more we choke it to death. Do me a favor. Please write this down. To lose our lives for the sake of Jesus and the gospel is to give up our right to define our lives by our version of what life is. To lose our lives means that we give that right to Jesus to define our lives. And when we do that, God will give us the life we really long for now and forever. First fear is, is, um, is, is the loss of life. Fear number two is the loss of security. Verse 36, Jesus says, What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their, whole, their, their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Gaining the whole world is an exaggeration beyond what most of us are, are thinking about here in Northwest Arkansas. What Jesus is focused on is what we're filling our lives with and why. On a smaller scale, most of us have way too much stuff. Ruth and I, confession, we have way too much stuff. And the reason most of us have so much stuff is pretty simple. We like having stuff. And you know what? Filling our lives with with the stuff of the world is like telling ourselves that we have the ability to fill the empty spaces of our lives to provide for our our needs, to deal with the circumstances of our lives. But but what if following Jesus means Jesus is telling us to give everything away? Maybe to to move overseas uh, or to live in community right here in the United States with those who are, are less fortunate or they're marginalized. Or maybe it means to give a substantial amount of that money uh, that typically goes for stuff. Give it to those who are who are overseas sharing the gospel or to kingdom workers and ministries here, right here in the United States that are reaching out to the marginalized. I believe what Jesus is asking is this. In our security in gaining the stuff of is our security in gaining the stuff of the world, or is our security in God? Let me just remind us there will never be enough stuff to bring us satisfaction. We can gain it all and yet still be empty. The security we're craving is only found in a relationship with the living God. And God's security is for today and forever. Fear number three is the loss of reputation. Verse 38, Jesus continues. He says, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the son of man will be ashamed of them when he comes into his father's glory with the holy angels. In other words, if we follow Jesus and we're going to live in opposition to what our present culture embraces, practically it means we'll be ostracized, we'll be misunderstood and ridiculed. Public opinion will be against us. Legislation will often go against us. We might even be persecuted. We might be thrown in jail. And like Jesus and his disciples and and many saints throughout church history and many brothers and sisters in other countries, It may even mean martyrdom, that we give our life for Jesus. So Jesus is saying we need to weigh public opinion against what God thinks. Please hear this. When we enter into eternity, what's going to be infinitely more important is what God thinks of us. Not our culture, not social media, not our friends, and not even our families. You say, come on, Lee, you're you're kind kind of bringing me down. Can you throw me a happy bone? Give me something. Yes. Yes, I can. And here it is. Jesus is addressing our fears, but he's also giving us a promise. And here's the promise. Here's, here, here is the happy bone. When Jesus comes back in all of the indescribable awesomeness of his divine glory, at the head of the angelic armies of heaven to rule and reign in all of his sovereign majesty, those who have lived for Jesus will be with Jesus forever. Let me finish by saying there are people who are, quote unquote, into Jesus. And there are people who are in Jesus. Let me say that again. There are people who are into Jesus. And there are people who are in Jesus. Now, into Jesus means there are people who, you know, who get just enough of Jesus to sort of kind of follow him on their terms, but not his. They they are Christians with qualified commitment. Unfortunately, there are churches that are are full of people who are into Jesus. But praise God, there are also people who are in Jesus 
and they're all in. Not, not, they're not perfect, but they are committed to what Jesus says. That is, they actually believe every word that the Bible says. And they believe in a supernatural, star-breathing, resurrecting Jesus. And they're committed to following him, no matter the cost. So, as we finish, let me just remind us as followers of Jesus who are all in, that our calling is to a life of unconditional obedience where the price is unknown. We don't know what's going to happen. Timothy Keller writes this, and I quote, If we had earned our salvation, our lives would still be our own. He'd owe us something. But, but since our salvation is by free grace due totally to His love, then there's nothing He cannot ask of us. You see, the path Jesus chose The path to the cross is the path he calls us to. Diedrich Bonhoeffer said this. He said, the cross is laid on every single Christian. So when Christ calls a man or a woman, he bids them come, come and die. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and our time together. Even though we are are filming this, we know that you have knit our hearts together as the family of God that crosses all boundaries. So we are greatly profoundly, overwhelmingly blessed to live every day in your presence, for you live in us. Scripture says when we are believers, your Holy Spirit takes up residence inside of us, and you produce in us love and peace and joy and gentleness, goodness, faith, humility, and self-discipline. Thank you. Thank you that you are not ashamed of us, that you are not ashamed to call us sons and daughters. You are not ashamed to be our God, and we are not ashamed of you nor would we want to do anything to bring shame on your name. And because of our relationship with you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you make us witnesses. You make us servants. And life is rich and blessed and full, and this is only a foretaste, just a a preview of the coming attractions of heaven. Thank you for your kindness to us, your mercy to us as unworthy sinners. That's why we're here. That's why we've sung with all of our hearts and our voices to you because this is a way for us to express our love. And so is our obedience. And so is our faithfulness. Father, sustain us. Sustain us in those things for your glory, we pray. Amen. Now, maybe you're, you're watching and you're thinking, I- I'm, into, I'm into Jesus, kind of, sort of. Good guy, good teacher and all that. But I don't think I'm in Jesus. Lee, how do I do that? Well, here's what the Bible says in the New Testament book of Romans. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised, resurrected Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. 37 years ago, that's what I did. I said, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner and I desperately need you to save me. I want to turn from my sin and turn to you as my only Savior. I believe you died for my sin and you rose again, triumphing over my sin um, so that I might, I might have abundant life now and eternal life forever. If you're watching this, you can do that right now and be in Jesus and have the extraordinary life he's called you to. Thank you for choosing to join us in worship and hearing and receiving the word of God. As we close, we ask that you use these next few moments to pray together and share communion. We'd also love and encourage you to reach out to someone with a text or phone call or encourage them and to remind them of Jesus' love for them. And maybe you have filled with the love and peace and presence of the Holy Spirit this week.